Okay, good day to everyone. Welcome to the next session in this ISCP 2021. My name is Dennis Chua and I'm a pharmacist from Singapore. Together with Professor Thomas Kahan from Sweden, we will be your moderators for this session. For the next one hour, we are privileged to have three, spe three speakers, Professor George Nong, Professor Thomas Kahan, and Professor Grigori Lip to present on this session. Some disclosures for this session. The content of this webinar is copyrighted by the ISCP and should not be distributed without the prior permission of the ISCP. The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the ISCP. The session will be live streamed via the following uh, Facebook and YouTube pages, and there will be CME points for attendees who attend the full session. Finally, you will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent via email after the webinar. <laughs> there will be the live Q&A box if you have any questions, so do type your questions in while you attend the session. Okay, so without further ado, let's have our first speaker for this session, Professor George Nord. He's a specialist in the Heart Clinic Zurich, Switzerland. And we are having him to present on the following, the roles and effects of thrombocyte inhibitors and anticoagulants in stroke prevention for patients with atrial fibrillation. Professor Josh Nall, please. Um, dear colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, present you some data uh, concerning antithrombolytic therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, we know that the vitamin K antagonists are highly effective. A meta-analysis published in 2007 showed that adjusted dose warfarin reduces its risk of stroke by 64%. And also antiplatelet agents have some effects reducing the risk by 22%. In patients with known atrial fibrillation, uh, vitamin K antagonists are underused. You see here on the left side, patients admitted with acute ischemic stroke, only about 40% uh, 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 of patients receive warfarin and only about 10% of the patients are in a therapeutic uh, range. Uh, if you look at patients with previous ischemic stroke admitted for uh, uh, and again a stroke, you see that there is a, a slight improvement, about 18% of patients are in the therapeutic range. But we see that most of the patients are even not receiving adequate treatment. We know that um, there, is, uh, there are risk factors for stroke in patients with atrial fibrillations, and we calculate the risk using the chats vast score, including heart failure, hypertension, the age, diabetes, and other factors. And you see the more of these factors are present, the higher is the annual risk for stroke. Patients with five uh, points uh, already have a stroke risk of about 15% per year. So there is indeed uh, indication and a class A indication uh, to use the CHATS-VASC score to um, assess the risk uh, for uh, stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. And according to the score, the indication for anticoagulation is uh, made. We see that we have quite a lot of problems with vitamin K antagonists. INR control is not optimal. You see here different countries uh, ranging for, from 44% to 77% of values in the therapeutic range. And we know that there is a, a small uh, therapeutic range uh, for the uh, vitamin K antagonist, I, uh, INR of two between two and three is optimal. Uh, below two, there is a risk of ischemic stroke and above three, there is uh, bleeding, especially intracranial bleeding. And if you look at intracranial bleeding, about 1% um, uh, uh, experience intracranial bleeding, which is much more frequent with warfarin compared to abixaban and NOAC. Uh, you can see here. And the type of intracranial bleeding is in most cases spontaneous and it's intracerebral. Um, so um, it has a very bad prognosis. And what you see there, ENR uh, is in 
cases of intracranial bleeding about 80% below three. So it means in the optimal range. Looking at um, the comparison between aspirin, which um, um, often is um, made as an alternate, alternative to uh, anticoagulation. This was studied in the Avro study with more than 5,000 patients. Um, patients are randomized to aspirin or apixaban, 2.5 milligrams uh, BID, and the aspirin range was between 81 to 324 milligrams per day. In most uh, patients, 81 milligrams per day. And you see that there is a dramatic reduction um, of uh, stroke and systemic embolism in patients receiving a NOAC compared to aspirin. And in contrast, Bleeding is about the same. So the risk of bleeding is the same, but uh, there is a substantial reduction using an OAC in patients with atrial fibrillation. Looking at the landmark trials, uh, comparing vitamin K antagonists with the new oral anticoagulants, with the different drugs we have, uh, dabigatram, uh, uh, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, and apixaban, you see these landmark trials they uh, reduce the risk of uh, stroke and systemic embolism by about 20% compared to the treatment with warfarin. And if you look at major bleeding, there is in most cases a significant reduction. You see the apixaban and the edoxaban showed a reduction in major bleeding. Uh, in uh, the Begatron and the Rivaroxaban trial, it was comparable to the patients treated with warfarin. So uh, the um, recommendations of the European Society of Cardiology, uh, published in 2020, they say that for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation patients who are eligible for oral anticoagulation, NOACs are recommended in preference to vitamin K antagonists. Let's now move to a special uh, field, uh, patients with uh, interventions in coronary interventions and uh, atrial fibrillation. How do we treat them with anti-thrombotic uh, therapy? Um, we have data with vitamin K antagonists with the WUST trial published uh, 2013 in The Lancet. And you see that a triple therapy, including um, vitamin K antagonists plus two uh, thrombocyte um, aggregation inhibitors, there is a massive increase in bleeding compared to those treated with warfarin uh, with uh, clopidogrel. Uh, there was a 64% reduction in bleeding using just one um, uh, platelet inhibitor. And looking at secondary endpoints, uh, death, myocardial infarction, target vessel revascularization, stroke, and um, um, the stent thrombosis, there was a 40% reduction in those patients um, receiving uh, warfarin plus um, uh, um, thrombocyte aggregation inhibitor compared to triple therapy. And the most impressive is a reduction of 61% uh, concerning death. Um, with the new oral anticoagulants, several trials have been performed. Uh, uh, the Pioneer Reduel and Trust and Augustus trial uh, with Rivaroxaban, Endoxaban, Apixaban, and Dabekatran. And uh, um, all the trials showed uh, more or less the same results. I just show you the data of the Augustus trial with four arms. Uh, Apixaban versus vitamin K antagonist, and then the patients in combination with clopidogrel, and then the patients were randomized either to aspirin and placebo. Published in uh, recently, the two years ago, uh, these patients were 4,600 patients uh, were randomized, as I mentioned, and uh, they were treated with Apixaban, five milligrams by PID, versus vitamin K antagonists with a near NAR of two to three. 
And looking at the bleeding, the highest rate of bleeding was with vitamin K antagonist clopidogrel uh, um, plus aspirin with 18.7%, uh, significantly lower with abixaban and uh, two platelet inhibitors. Um, the uh, vitamin K antagonist only with clopidogrel 10.9%, and the best concerning bleeding was a big saban with clopidogrel with a bleeding of 7.3%. Looking at death and hospitalization, uh, a big saban um, versus uh, vitamin K antagonist, 28% almost with a uh, vitamin K antagonist and only 24% uh, with a big saban. This was an uh, absolute risk reduction of almost 4% and the number needed to treat of 26 to avoid one death or hospitalization using a big saban instead of a vitamin K antagonist. And also stroke was significantly reduced uh, in the a big saban trial have arm compared to vitamin K antagonist hospitalizations also significantly reduced. Myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis was not affected uh, using two platelet inhibitors or only one, clopidogrel or clopidogrel plus aspirin. So therefore there is no uh, indication to use uh, triple therapy in these patients. And there is a meta-analysis looking at uh, triple therapy with vitamin K antagonist and the double therapy with uh, NOAC. Uh, they showed that there is a significant reduction in major bleeding and uh, the, the, our all-cause death is not affected as well as myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis. Let's look now in patients with stable coronary artery disease. This was uh, investigated in the FIRE uh, trial, uh, recently published in the New England Journal. And looking at the combination therapy, um, rivaroxaban with a, uh, aspirin uh, or clopidogrel, and looking at rivaroxaban alone, there was a 28% reduction in the primary endpoint of major bleeding. Looking at uh, the clinical events, stroke, systemic embolism, myocardial infarction, in unstable angina, you, uh, requiring revascularization or death, there was a significant reduction by 41% using only rivaroxaban instead of the combination of rivaroxaban and aspirin. Um, therefore, the um, societies recommend to reduce a risk a triple therapy for a very short time in elective PCI only for uh, seven days in acute coronary syndromes for one month using clopidogrel and aspirin, if you use ticagrelor and aspirin only for one week, then uh, dual therapy is recommended uh, for six to one, six months to one year, and after one year, only uh, the use of uh, NOAC is recommended. These, this um, may differ according to the risk of the patient. If you have a high bleeding risk, you may shorten the um, period of uh, multi anti thrombotic therapy. Um, if you have a high risk patient with a um, main stem uh, disease or a complex um, revascularization, you may extend the duration of um, uh, double or triple therapy. This um, I have taken from the recent recommendations published by Jan Steffel in Europace, which um, is a very comprehensive uh, guideline uh, how we have to use the uh, NOACs uh, in daily practice. Um, I just uh, picked uh, up some uh, data for which patient we have uh, to uh, use which NOAC. That's my personal opinion. After stroke, I would recommend uh, Apixaban, then Rivaroxaban or Dabegatran. Renal insufficiency, Apixaban, Edoxaban um, is preferred. After GI bleed, I would recommend low-dose Edoxaban 
or apixaban, and the low dose edoxaban is not uh, yet uh, um, approved, uh, but we have data concerning that uh, I will show you in a moment. Once daily, edoxaban or rivaroxaban, if you have a, a concern uh, interaction with a SIP inhibitor, you may use a dabigatram or edoxaban. If you have to use adapt co-medication, I would uh, use low-dose edoxaban, abixaban, or rivaroxaban with a high chance VASC score, rivaroxaban, um, uh, then dabigatron or abixaban. A high bleeding risk, a low-dose edoxaban or abixaban. But the most important thing, you have to anticoagulate coagulate the patient. And this is just that we have evidence for edoxaban uh, in patients um, with atrial fibrillation at a dose of 15 milligrams daily. This was a, a study in a, a aged population, the age uh, above 80 years. The Chatsvask score was above or um, equal to. And if you look at stroke and systemic embolism, there was a 66% reduction. Major bleeding was uh, slightly increased, but this did not reach statistical significance. Um, just um, um, that's um, the conclusions. Uh, patients with atrial fibrillations are at increased risk for thromboembolism. Anticoagulation reduces the risk for thromboembolism. The preferred drugs, therefore, are a new oral anticoagulants. After PCI, triple therapy is indicated only for one week to one month. In stable patients, uh, after coronary artery patients, monotherapy with a no NOAC is sufficient. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Paul, for that enlightening presentation on the use of thrombocyte and anticoagulants inhibitors in atrial fibrillation for stroke prevention purposes. Okay, next up, we have our second speaker, Professor Thomas Kahan. He's from the Karolinska Institute of Pharmacological Sciences and Emirates Hospital, Division of Cardiovascular Medicine in Stockholm, Sweden. He'll be sharing with us on the impact of blood pressure and antihypertensive treatment on incident and recurrent stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Dr. Thomas Kahan, please. Thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation to talk about blood pressure and stroke. My disclosures are presented here. This study clearly shows the strong relation between blood pressure and stroke mortality. And you can appreciate that already low values of systolic and diastolic blood pressure has a clear relation to stroke fatality. Similarly, blood pressure has a strong uh, impact on risk for incident atrial fibrillation. Here are data from a Norwegian study with a long 35-year follow-up, and again, already low values of systolic and diastolic blood pressures clearly increases the risk for atrial fibrillation. And similar results have been obtained also in middle-aged women. This is one of several important meta-analyses. Here are some 600,000 patients in antihypertensive drug studies were analyzed. And you appreciate that the standardized effect of a 10 millimeter mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure will reduce the risk for stroke and heart failure by some 25%. Uh, also coronary heart disease and cardiovascular events, as well as all cause mortality are reduced to a somewhat smaller extent. And this effect is related to the magnitude of blood pressure reduction. So blood pressure reduction is important and has important effects. In this analysis from southern Sweden in 28,000 hypertensive patients on 
antihypertensive medication, the authors set out to see the risk for stroke in different strata of blood pressure control. And the authors concluded that the population attributable risk adjusted for agent six indicated that 45% of strokes in subjects with treatment for hypertension might be attributed to uncontrolled blood pressure. Now, not all drug classes may have similar effects. These results from the LIFE study, hypertensive patients with hypertensive heart disease, show to the left that patients treated with losartan-based therapy had a lower proportion of new onset atrial fibrillation as compared to people treated with atenolol-based therapy. And this was then independent on, of blood pressure reduction and other cardiovascular risk factors, including left ventricular mass. This effect on atrial fibrillation nicely transfers into cardiovascular event on right-hand uh, panel. In blue, patients with new on onset atrial fibrillation have markedly higher risks for stroke, acute MI, and cardiovascular morbidity. In a more extensive meta-analysis on this topic by the Milan Group in Italy, uh, it is obvious that for stroke reduction, calcium antagonists on your lower left, calcium antagonists appear to reduce stroke risk to a greater extent than other drug classes, whereas beta blockers seem to have a reduced effect on stroke incidence as compared to other drug classes. For coronary artery disease, ROS blockers seem to have a benefit, but for all-cause mortality, it appears that all major drug classes have a similar benefit. If we look into secondary stroke prevention, here is one meta-analysis showing to the left that the reduction in cardiovascular events is related to the magnitude of blood pressure reduction in terms of achieved systolic blood pressure. You can, on your right-hand side, see that the risk for recurrent stroke is about 25% lower in patients treated with drug therapy as compared to placebo, whereas, again, cardiovascular death was reduced to a slightly lower extent, about 15%. These and other studies form the basis of the current guidelines. Here are the European guidelines, where blood pressure target now is 120 to 129 over 70 to 79 in patients up to 65 years of age, slightly higher levels at the older population. And these recommendations are valid also for patients with concomitant diabetes or cardiovascular disease, including stroke. American guidelines have similar recommendations. And here specifically are the strategies for hypertensive patients with a previous stroke. On your left, the recommended drug therapy for stroke in the European guidelines are ROS blockers plus a calcium channel blocker or a thiazide like diuretic, whereas the American guidelines recommend a combination of ROS blocker and a thiazide diuretic. Both guidelines uh, head for a blood pressure reduction to below 130 over 80 in patients with a previous stroke. As for blood pressure control and bleeding events during anticoagulant therapy, I will share with you a few data. This is one observational cohort study from Japan in 4,000 patients where 
about half were taking antiplatelet drugs and about a third were taking anticoagulant drugs. Left-hand panel shows that patients who developed an intracranial hemorrhage had slightly higher blood pressure levels than those who had only extracranial hemorrhage or no hemorrhagic event at all. On your right-hand panel, it is clear that the blood pressure control uh, has an impact on the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And the authors show that the optimal cutoff blood pressure level to predict impending risk for intracranial hemorrhage was 130 over 81 millimeters of mercury. Extending this and other studies, we earlier this year presented data from our Scandinavian primary care cardiovascular database, where we have patients attending primary care with the diagnosis of hypertension. We selected patients free of a previous stroke and with no history of atrial fibrillation, and then studied those with new onset atrial fibrillation who were newly initiated or oral anticoagulant treatment and studied the risk to develop hemorrhagic stroke. The results on your left show that if baseline blood pressure was between 145 and 180 millimeters mercury systolic, the risk for having a hemorrhagic stroke was more than twofold increase as compared to a reference value of 130 millimeters of mercury systolic. So in summary, elevated blood pressure is a strong predictor for incident and recurrent atrial fibrillation and for stroke. Current guidelines have new targets and ranges for blood pressure, and this includes more active treatment, and this is also true in the old and very old patients. Decisions about antihypertensive treatment should focus on reducing cardiovascular risk rather than blood pressure values alone. ROS blockers plus a calcium channel blocker, a thiazide-like drug, are the recommended antihypertensive agents for secondary stroke prevention, and the target blood pressure is below 130 over 80 millimeters of mercury for most people. And finally, uncontrolled blood pressure in patients with atrial fibrillation oral anticoagulant treatment increases the risk for hemorrhagic stroke, and this deserves careful attention to attain target blood pressure. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Prof, for the informative speech on the blood pressure control with antihypertensive treatment on preventing incident and recurrent stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Okay, last but not least, we have our third speaker for this session, Professor Grigori Lip. He is from Fry's Evans Chair of Cardiovascular Medicine, University of Liverpool, United Kingdom. He will be sharing with us on this topic, holistic approach to SPAF, the ABC approach. Professor Gregory Lip, please. Hello, I'm Gregory Lip, and it's a great pleasure to be able to speak at this Congress on a holistic approach to atrial fibrillation care. I'm from the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom, and I am the director of the Liverpool Center for Cardiovascular Science. Here are my disclosures, so I'm not going to read every line, but just put into context everything I say or speak in this presentation with regard to these declarations. Well, if you think about the management of atrial fibrillation in terms of any textbook on cardiology, uh, the aspects with regard to atrial fibrillation risk assessment and management are summarized on this slide. And these are the various steps because any textbook chapter will cover stroke prevention, it will cover symptom management and discussion about rate control or rhythm control for the management of atrial fibrillation. And bear in mind, these patients are often elderly. Let's focus on cardiovascular risk factors and comorbidity optimization. So in the real world, we require simple and practical decision-making processes how to manage patients in a uniform manner, given how common atrial fibrillation is. 
to the so-called patient pathway to manage atrial fibrillation in a holistic manner. And this brings into consideration with regard to improving their awareness, improving the detection of patients with atrial fibrillation. And this is very much the ethos of the 2020 European Society of Cardiology Guidelines for the, the Diagnosis and Management of Atrial Fibrillation. And these are guidelines that take a very patient-centric approach. These are not guidelines for the super-specialist electrophysiologist. These are for guidelines that are for you and I, for non-specialists, for general practitioners to manage atrial fibrillation in a uniform and holistic manner. And the guidelines can be summed up as this, CC to ABC. What does this stand for? Well, the CC is firstly to confirm the diagnosis because before you actually start the management of atrial fibrillation, you have to confirm this is clearly uh, present. We then characterize atrial fibrillation, and this is reflects how we evaluate the patients with atrial fibrillation in everyday clinical practice. And that includes stroke uh, assessment, stroke risk with the chaps vas score, symptom severity with the ERA score, then we have severity of atrial fibrillation burden, and this refers to paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation, and then substrate severity, which includes uh, comorbidities and as well as the uh, structural heart disease. That's the CC. Going on then to ABC, and ABC essentially refers to A for anticoagulation or AOI stroke, where the default is offering stroke prevention unless the patient is low risk. So you identify the low risk patients with a chest vas score. Uh, afterwards, patient with one or more stroke risk factors should be offered stroke prevention, which is anticoagulation. And then the third step is to, is to make your choice of anticoagulation. B is better symptom control, and this refers to patient-centered and symptom-directed decisions on rate or rhythm control. And finally, the C, the C is, is for comorbidity risk optimization, including lifestyle type changes. So I'll uh, focus a bit on stroke prevention because a lot of attention has been directed to optimizing stroke prevention strategies. But before you uh, manage or treat with uh, anticoagulation, you need to assess stroke risk. And the message really is keep it simple and keep it practical because there are lots of stroke risk factors that have been described. The more common and the more validated ones that we put into risk stratification schemes, these risk scores are simplifications to help decision-making all the clinical risk scores and for atrial fibrillation and non-atrial fibrillation scenarios, they have modest predictive value for identifying the high risk patients. You can of course have much more complicated risk scores. You can have, of course have biomarkers. They only marginally improve but on prediction. And remember that statistical significance is not the same as clinical significance. And finally, risk is dynamic. Risk is not static. And stroke risk in atrial fibrillation should therefore focus on the risk factors rather than these artificial categorization into low and moderate and high risk strata. So the chas vas score is illustrated here, and this is the score used in the, most of the guidelines internationally. The differences from the older CHADS2 score are highlighted in red. And to illustrate what I mean by simplification, because age is such a powerful driver of stroke risk, but age 65 to 74 gets one point and 75 and above gets two points. But it's only common sense to all of us that a man with atrial fibrillation age 65 is going to be substantially lower risk than a man with atrial fibrillation age 74. Also, a man with atrial fibrillation age 74 in 11 months comes to your clinic, gets one point. They come back four weeks later, they become 75, they get two points. It does not mean that uh, these patients' uh, risk suddenly doubles. Also, recognizing that risk changes over time. These are patients initially at low risk with a chance vas score zero in males or one in females, and you can see over time how the risk changes. The most steepest gradient is for hypertension, and it's followed by heart failure, then diabetes and vascular disease. So uh, risk does change over time with aging, with incident comorbidities, and risk assessment is clearly necessary. So in terms of the A of the ABC, Keep it simple, the default is stroke prevention unless they are low risk, given the limitations of all the uh, risk stratification schemes that we've been discussing. And stroke prevention means oral anticoagulation, whether offering that as well-managed warfarin with a good time and therapeutic range above 70%, or these days, ideally, with a NOAA, a non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulant. The algorithm in the ESC guidelines are shown here. Now, firstly, of course, you have the patients with significant valvular heart disease. That's prosthetic mechanical heart valves or, or severe mitral stenosis where it's a vitamin K antagonist such as warfarin, not a NOAA. Uh, other patients without significant valvular disease in the old terminology, the so-called non-valvular atrial fibrillation, 
Well, the first step really is to focus on identifying the low risk patients with a child's blood score zero in males or one in females. No antithrombotic therapy is indicated. The next step is to offer stroke prevention to patients with one or more stroke risk factors. Um, and uh, you are giving anticoagulation. So you assess bleeding risk. And then the last step is uh, the NOACs are the preferred option in these patients. Bleeding risk should be used appropriately and responsibly. The best um, bleeding risk score in this PCORI systematic review and evidence appraisal is the HESPLET score. So as an evidence-based guideline, not an eminence-based guideline or a VIP-based guideline, this is an evidence-based guideline, the HESPLET score is recommended. And the, the HESPLET score should be used to flag up modifiable bleeding risk factors for intervention and mitigation and to schedule a follow-up of high bleeding risk patients for early review and follow-up. This was illustrated in this uh, ancillary analysis to the MAFA2 trial, which randomized patients to an intervention based on the ABC pathway uh, using the MAFA intervention in mobile health compared to usual care. And as you can see, major bleeding at 12 months, 2% in the intervention arm, 4.3% in the usual care. And you will see bleeding, uh, you will see also anticoagulation declining in the usual care from 59% down to 34%. Whereas in the intervention now with appropriate and responsible use of bleeding risk uh, scores to mitigate bleeding risk factors and to schedule high risk patients for follow-up anticoagulation increased from 63% to 70%. So in terms of the B and the C, as I mentioned, B refers to symptom focusing on in improving symptoms uh, with rate or rhythm control. And then finally C is addressing comorbidities and lifestyle type changes. So in terms of the uh, figure I showed before, so if you think about improving awareness and detection of atrial fibrillation, that's essentially the CC, because can confirm the diagnosis and characterize the arrhythmia. And the rest of the patient pathway uh, is essentially the ABC pathway there. Why is this important? Atrial fibrillation is so common. They present to general practitioners, emergency room, non-cardiologists, cardiologists. And we therefore uh, we owe to our patients to give a simple and practical approach to their care and management. Because central to this is the patient where we need to improve care. And whether they present to primary care, whether they present to secondary care. And this, of course, is the ABC pathway. A, avoid stroke. B, better symptom management. And C, cardiovascular and risk factor optimization. Because if you superimpose the previous uh, diagram, this is really as easy as ABC with a patient, whether presenting to primary care or to secondary care, and this is the whole patient pathway. How do you operationalize this pathway? Well, this is the primary care clinical pathway for atrial fibrillation detection and management. And you, uh, you will see this is uh, issued by NHS England and Public Health England. And at the top here, we have the detection. Here we have the risk assessment, which is CHASVAS and the HESBLAT score. And here you have the ABC of atrial fibrillation management as already described, A, avoid stroke, B, better symptom management, and C, comorbidity optimization. And of course, you can superimpose the CC there to the ABC. This has been tested in the MAFA2 trial, uh, and uh, the, the screening and the awareness and the detection was published as the Huawei Heart Study. And then the patients were entered into the MAFA2 trial, which is cluster randomized trial of ABC pathway versus usual care. And of course, this, the first bit is the CC, then you have the ABC there as the intervention. The primary um, results from the MAFA2 trial were published in 2020, and you will see here for the primary outcome of stroke, thromboembolism, death, and hospitalization, ABC intervention was significantly uh, better compared to uh, usual care. And this was primarily um, driven by the impact on hospitalization and was consistent irrespective of the different subgroups. So let me conclude about uh, the holistic approach to managing atrial fibrillation, easy as ABC. You can sum this up as CC to ABC with uh, confirm the diagnosis, characterize atrial fibrillation, and you have the 4S scheme that we talked about before. Then after the CC, you enter the ABC pathway with regard to A, avoid stroke, B, better symptom control, and C, comorbidity and cardiovascular risk factor management. And with that, Thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you, Prof, for the summed up talk on the holistic approach of patients with atrial fibrillation. Next, we have our panel discussion with our faculty panel. Before we begin, I regret to inform that Professor Vigori Lip is unable to be here live with us. 
Any unanswered questions can be emailed to the ICP Secretariat by the email shared earlier. Okay, I shall start by polling a question to Prof. Thomas Kahan. So we know that on the subject of BT targets, there was a trial, a spring trial conducted, and it concluded with lower cardiovascular risk with BP as low as below 120, 80, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, would you like to share, I would like to have uh, whether, Prof, do you want to share your views on the trial since you also concluded a BP of 130, 80 in your slide set? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, the SPRINT trial concluded that intensive antihypertensive therapy seems to be superior to more traditional therapy, and intensive was a target of below 120 over uh, systolic, uh, and the traditional or conservative was then below 140. And, uh, I would say that the SPRINT trial uh, indicates or strengthens the evidence that we should probably go below 140 with some margins. That is perhaps uh, substantially lower than 140. And that is exactly what the, both the American and the current European guidelines suggest. That is that in most people, a blood pressure target of 130 over 80 or below is recommended. Uh, it has been a debate and it's still ongoing on how blood pressure was measured in SPRINT. Uh, it is not entirely clear, but apparently several of the patients were measured by a automated unattended blood pressure measurement, which generally uh, gives you slightly lower blood pressure levels than traditional office blood pressures. And it may be that the 120 used in the SPRINT study corresponds to something like 130 or uh, about 130 systolic. So in my view, the SPRINT study supports the current recommendations that a blood pressure of 130 over 80 rather than 140 over 90 is valid for most people. Uh, there is also a risk of uh, more side effects with lower blood pressures, and that was clearly shown in SPRINT as well with renal failure mainly. Uh, the other question you may raise is then whether all patients and all comorbidities should have the same target blood pressure. And uh, current recommendations, both in the US and in Europe, say that the target blood pressure is the same independent of uh, comorbidity. So it's not the old way of saying that if you have a diabetes or if you have uh, another concomitant disease, you should have a different blood pressure target. By and large, uh, same blood pressures, whether or not you have comorbidities. And that's why the stroke recommendations then again say target is 130 or below for most patients. Okay, thank you, Prof. Kahan, for that illuminating response to the question on BP targets. I see that there's uh, you have questions for Prof. Non. May. May I start off with a question to George Noll? Uh, an issue which is not uncommon, at least if you work in a hospital, as we both do, is uh, that people undergoing surgery, in, the, in particular cardiac surgery, have perioperative atrial fibrillation or perhaps postoperative atrial fibrillation. And there are vivid discussions, at least in our hospital, whether this should uh, qualify for anticoagulant therapy. And if so, for how long? It seems reasonable that if you do surgery on the heart, you may have reasons to have an arrhythmia, which is not a chronic disease the same as if you have atrial fibrillation because of 
atherosclerotic disease or hypertension. So what, what do you say? Should we treat a single episode of perioperative atrial fibrillation with lifelong oral anticoagulants? Um, I would suggest, no, I think that's a special condition. And uh, we see it quite often that uh, patients after cardiac surgery develop uh, atrial fibrillation within the first few days after the um, surgery. And this is mainly due to irritation of the heart muscle or the pericardium. And in these patients, anticoagulation is indicated. Um, we um, continue anticoagulation for at least two months. And then uh, we assess um, with uh, halter monitoring over two to seven days, whether there is still atrial fibrillation. If not, then we stop uh, oral anticoagulation and replace it uh, by uh, a platelet inhibitor. Are there any studies on this or is this just uh, um, empiric? The, the, there are some studies um, looking at how long um, uh, atrial fibrillation persists. In some patients which have atherosclerosis, they uh, develop atheros um, atrial fibrillation several times in the, after the course um, of, um, mm -hmm. of uh, the surgery. But in some younger patients, there is only one episode. The same you see in patients with acute inflammation. In uh, patients with uh, pneumonia, you have the same problem. And um, I think one uh, episode of atrial fibrillation in, in a hypertensive, uh, let's say, 45-year-old man or woman um, after a party last night, um, I, I think there is no real indication to start anticoagulation lifelong. Um, I, but I think um, we, we have to look in these high, according to Chad's um, score, we have to search for episodes of anticoagulation. Uh, we know that also in patients with sinus rhythm, the Chad's VASC score uh, predicts um, um, stroke. Um, so I think we have to, to look at high-risk patients um, in whom we, we, uh, we search for atrial fibrillation and then um, start anticoagulation. Thank you. Dennis, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, there is a question uh, by the audience on, uh, because we know that Charts Fast has blood score, the scoring systems that we use to assess stroke and bleeding risk, these are dynamic scoring systems with changes in age and uh, other factors uh, within the patient. So uh, is there any suggested frequency where patients should be reviewed how often so that such dynamic changes are taken into account in order to better uh, customize and optimize the patient's anti-thrombotic therapies. Uh, would either of the profs would like to take this question? Um, you know, um, I think it's it's recommended to assess um, risk for stroke as well as bleeding risks um, several times. I think we we have to personalize. Uh, treatment in our patients with atrial fibrillation and as well as hypertension. And therefore, we always have uh, to assess uh, risk for stroke and bleeding in these patients and then discuss with the patients how we treat these uh, risks. I see. Okay. So it's more of like a time to time and customized to patient. Mm -hmm etc. kind of uh, consideration, yeah. Okay, uh, there's another question for Prof. Non on the duration of a uh, triple antithrombotic therapy. So in patients with ACS but they didn't undergo PCI with stenting, would the duration of this triple antithrombotic therapy, is it still just one week and up to a month or is it different for this group of people? 
Um, you, you know, in, in the beginning, we, we used uh, triple therapy for a long time. And what we saw is that there is an increased risk for bleeding in these patients. So um, during the last, let's say, um, about uh, five to 10 years, we shortened the duration of triple therapy. And what we saw is that despite we, we use triple therapy for uh, one week to, to one month in acute coronary syndrome, irrespective of whether we treat them with PCI or not, um, that um, this um, has a substantial reduction in bleeding. And on the other hand, we don't, um, the, we overestimated the risk of um, stent thrombosis and cardiovascular events. Therefore, um, the, the guidelines say that you should minimize the, the period of um, triple therapy and then go to a double uh, ter therapy. And after one year, we have now a lot of evidence that uh, anticoagulation alone is sufficient in these patients. And here, perhaps, it's even more important to individualize therapy. I mean, we, we know that if we evaluate the risk for thrombosis versus the risk for bleeding, we should then shorten the time of double or triple therapy for those with high risk of complications and vice versa. And it's Absolutely. not a, a standard therapy. It's very much individualization. And this is something you have to do during the follow-up. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. Uh, patient of patients, a uh, specific way of approach uh, is the uh, important way to go as well. Uh, there are also questions on duration of anticoagulation with regards to certain perhaps limitations on the use of them. So on the account of using vitamin K antagonists, there's the concern of a suboptimal INR control. And with the 10A inhibitors, there's also the concerns of uh, with some countries not having the antidotes to them. So uh, in view of these possible uh, adverse events, uh, suboptimal INR control with VKA, bleeding without antidotes when they use 10A inhibitors, uh, are there any potential for different duration of this anticoagulant use in patients with AF besides lifelong? Um, I, I didn't really uh, understand uh, it, um, um, the, the connection is, is somehow disturbed, but um, uh, the NOAC, all the NOACs have quite a short duration of action. And these um, antidotes, are not very often used because um, after, if we look, for instance, preoperatively, uh, 48 hours in most cases is enough to have uh, a coagulation state which allows uh, surgery. And um, the um, duration of action in, of all these NOACs or the half-life is about the same, um, despite they are uh, taken once daily or twice daily. And I think the, the advantage of taking it twice daily is that you use a lower dose and therefore um, this may explain the lower risk of bleeding with a big saban, for instance. Um, but I, I did not really um, acoustically um, understand, understood your, your question, maybe this, um, my answer is sufficient for that. Yeah, I think that's okay, Prof. Now, thank you so much for taking this question. Okay, uh, I think in the interest of time, we have to end this session. I want to thank the audience for participating in this session. I also want to thank uh, my faculty speakers, Professor Josh Now, Professor Thomas Kahan, and Professor Grigori, although who can't be here with us. So uh, with this, uh, uh, I'll conclude this uh, plenary session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.